All right. Welcome to Supercharge with Digital Marketer, the bi-weekly podcast where we discuss everything related to entrepreneurship and how marketing is important for your success in business venture. I'm your host and also the founder of Marketer, Crystal. So join us today episode as we dive in into the topic of how attachment style impact your leadership abilities. So with us today is Helen. Helen is an associate marriage and family therapist. We are super excited to hear some insight from Helen. Let's dive in. Hello, Helen. Thank you so much for joining us today. To get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your work, and what are you most passionate about? Hi, Crystal. Thank you for having me. The pleasure of being here. I've been following your podcast for a while. It's fascinating um, how you interview everyone who's starting their own business. It's just fascinating to learn. My name is Helen Altenbach. I am a classically trained cellist with a tenure position at the Los Angeles Opera Orchestra. I obtained a master's degree in relational psychotherapy during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, I am now also an associate marriage family therapist registered with the Board of Behavior Sciences in the state of California. So in my work as a musician, I am a team player. I am one of the musicians in a group of about 70 orchestra musicians. Sometimes it is with the opera. Sometimes it's with other freelance musicians who work in the movie studios recording for film soundtracks. In my work as a therapist, I enjoy helping people discover who they are and guide them in the reflection of whether their current life choices fit with who they want to be. But if those choices don't fit, we work on changing their circumstances from place of self-leadership and self-motivation so that people can lead fulfilled lives both inside and outside. Amazing to hear. So I I love to hear that, you know, you are now a therapist. You love helping people and everything. So what is the particular theory that you like to use in your work as a therapist? Yeah, there are so many different therapeutic approaches out there that are founded in scientific research and theories. The approach I currently use is based on the theory of attachment by John Bowlby. The reason I say currently use is that I do not believe that one approach is necessarily more effective than others across the board or for everyone. All theories and approaches can be effective for someone. In other words, a therapist's choice of theory is often guided by who they are as a person and therefore what issues interest them. So for me, the topic that interests me at this point in my life is adult attachment, specifically the attachment to one's identity, one's intimate partners, family members, friendships, and one's attachment to their work and career. It's amazing to hear. So can you walk us through about, you know, what is attachment style? Yeah, I think it would be responsible to start by saying what attachment style is it. (laughs) So attachment style is not a label we can use to, you know, quote unquote, figure people out and put them into boxes so we can feel comfortable and familiar in dealing with them. In that sense, attachment style is really like culture but not a stereotype of a culture people use to judge other people. For example, some people might use horoscope inappropriately to categorize who they prefer to interact with and say, oh, I get along with Leo and I don't get along with these other signs, right? And that, in a sense, is ignoring the whole person and what they can offer and only focusing on some traits objectively. So we want to avoid that interpretation of attachment style So now let me tell you what attachment is. So attachment style refers to the original bond between a child and their primary caretaker before the age of two. It is a major contributor to how we behave towards an intimate other in adulthood. The bond of attachment is what gives comfort and reassurance to a child in times of need. An attachment figure is the person the child reaches out for when they feel hurt or feel afraid. An attachment figure uh, can be anybody, can be a mother, a father, or a grandparent. But in adulthood, our inner child is the one who will seek safety and reassurance in times of distress. And the person we often reach out to is our intimate partner. That's very interesting to hear. Well, 
uh, about the horoscope one, I really agree about that because hor horoscope can be very biased. We are, you know, have different side, but doesn't mean that who we are, right? Because every one of us, we have different experience and also different personality to the horoscope isn't who we are. And it's really interesting about the attachment theory. Our caregiver, when we were young, that how they raise us really affect how us feel and how us, you know, react when we grow up and especially when we, you know, uh, react in certain like difficult situation in life. So uh, with that, can you walk us through um, what are some different attachment styles? Yeah, there are generally four types of attachment style. They are secure, anxious, avoidant, and disorganized. Uh, these are just names that were given, you know, by people who study the theory, say. Uh, so Mary Ensworth, uh, a student of John Bowlby who founded this theory of attachment, uh, Mary conducted an experiment with mothers and their babies, um, really under the age of two. And this experiment was called the strange situation. Um, so Mary placed a laboratory assistant in a room who is a total stranger to the child. So if you ever met babies, you'll recognize that generally very young kids don't feel safe around strangers. So, but in this room, there were also toys in the room, right, to help assess this child's ability to stay curious and play in this unfamiliar situation with this stranger in the room. So on the one hand, you have the stranger who the child might be afraid of and perceive as danger. And on the other hand, the toys represent curiosity and creativity. So Mary discovered that in the presence of a stranger, when the mother left the child alone with the stranger, the child was initially distressed, uh, presumably feeling unsafe with the stranger. But when the mother returned at the child's cry, the child was able to calm down and resume interaction with the mother. And later on, this child was able to interact with the stranger and play together um, with, uh, with the toys as long as the mother was in the room. So this represents a secure attachment uh, where the attachment figure, the mother, was available when the child needed her. So in this child's mind, the, this means that mother is always there where she needed her. And later on, this sense of security develops into a general sense of trust and safety that signals that the important people can be counted on when one is in need of support during difficult times. In contrast, Avoidant attachment is characterized by the indifference when a primary attachment figure leaves. In the child's mind, the mother cannot be relied on to provide safety from past experiences. Uh, for example, when the child cried in the past, the mother simply did not respond. Um, you know, this evokes feelings of abandonment. And after repeated confirmation of that sense of abandonment, the child no longer reaches out to be soothed by anyone when in distress. This child might play with toys to distract himself and might even get a lot of praise for being so self-sufficient. But nevertheless, an adult who grows up with this mindset can often suffer from depression, loneliness, and a fundamental lack of trust in others. Anxious attachment is a result of a child experiencing repeated abandonment by several primary attachment figures. This could be due to a parental separation, relocation, illness of a parent, or death of an attachment figure, such as a grandparent. At a, such a young age, this child might arrive at the wrong conclusion that he or she is not good enough, and they go on to believe, uh, they go on to become preoccupied with pleasing others in hopes that they will stay. In adulthood, this person will likely show characteristics of clinginess and might be overly focused on getting external approval from others. The disorganized attachment style is characterized by a combination of anxious and avoidant attachment injuries. In the experiment with the babies, this child continued to be upset when a mother returned, but refused to be comforted by her. This child fears abandonment, but also does not trust closeness. In adulthood, this could often look like someone who expresses sentiments like, I hate you, but don't leave me. Sounds familiar? I, I think 
it is important to also remember that attachment can look differently in different settings. Work, relationship versus family, versus friendships, versus romantic relationships. Often, romantic relationships will be more activating to the vulnerable parts of attachment injuries. However, depending on the person and the depth of the injury, you may see different patterns. Wow, that is very interesting to hear. I didn't know that these are for attachment style, and you know,、um, I feel lucky for someone who have secure attachment because you know they are more secure with their life, and that that would be amazing. But I feel like most of us gonna you know have different attachment. A, a lot of us gonna be more insecure because. Uh, the way of our parent raise us is not perfect, and yeah, it's very interesting to hear. And、uh, I also feel, you know, empathy for people who raised by parent who is unavailable when they grow up. They feel like fear of closeness or anxious of you know people leaving them. Yeah, so it really affect how we. Um, react to certain situation and interesting that you mentioned that attachment style can be different in many situation and relationship、uh, tend to be you know the one trigger the most. Um, so with that, I would love to know more about how attachment style can affect in the workplace. For example, the leadership style. Yeah. Um. That's before we move on. I just want to reiterate that yes. Absolutely, parents, despite their best efforts, right, to do the best they can, but none, virtually none of us, leave childhood without some kind of <laughs> injuries. So this is where therapy gives us a second chance to almost reparent ourselves、uh, and pick up the missing pieces. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a parent. Sometimes it could be that one teacher in third grade that really cared about you, and. Sometimes develop bonds, secure development bonds can、uh, come from very unexpected places, like a mentor, a teacher, or even a kind neighbor. So we're not entirely without hope. <laughs>、uh, so to answer your question, how does attachment affect leadership style? Remember the toys in Mary's experiment; those represent one's ability to stay curious and explore new things. When under perceived danger. People do not explore new things because familiarity is important to survival. Imagine a leader who feels the threat to the existence of their company, but change might be necessary. The familiarity in this case is not going to be helpful. This leader's internal attachment blueprint is going to influence how they perceive themselves and how they perceive others' behaviors, especially in times of uncertainty. Now, when you, when you are a startup leader, there's a lot of uncertainty. Right. So whether the leader is going to embrace change has less to do with their level of risk tolerance, but more to do with their internal sense of safety, and more importantly, their internal trust in others in times of need. Wow, that's very interesting to hear. So, how can a leader recognize the attachment behavior and provide the most effective so support the employee? Hmm. The fact that you're asking this question tells me that you really care about your well, the well-being of your employees, which in turn is one of the best ways to ensure a healthy culture of your own company. I want to come work for you. <laughs> one of the ways a leader can detect attachment injury is to watch how people behave under a deadline or some other stressors, and step up to provide psychological safety. This is often easier said than done because the leader or the boss is also human. And could be activated by the stressor themselves, and misread their employees' actions as well. Let's use an example. Let's say that a project is due, and a manager is asking about a projected timeline. The avoidantly attached employees might not respond to the inquiry because they are most likely using that time to get the work done. Let's say you are the manager, who has tendencies to be anxious. You worry that your clients will not give you the extra time needed. And will be unhappy with you. You will become frustrated by the lack of communication from your team, and you might double down on the inquiry. You know, your behavior might in turn activate your avoidantly attached employees 
into thinking that you're micromanaging them. What is worse is that their silence will continue to activate you into thinking that they don't care about their relationship with you. And you might go on to be frustrated or even resent them for not respecting you. Now, let's say you're a manager who grew up with an avoidant attachment style. You have always relied on yourself to get things done. You might find it annoying that some of your employees are asking for extension or for additional support. You might judge them for being, you know, a little codependent. After all, you managed to fly solo. Why shouldn't they step up and get the job done on time and without additional help? This could be very hard on your anxiously attached employees who are trying to do everything right and trying so hard to please you. They will most, they will most likely, in this case, be focused on how angry you are with them um, instead of being able to focus on the work that needs to be done. So they're preoccupied with the relationship with you and unable to you know, effectively function at their role. In either scenario, the manager is the one who doesn't get a satisfying result because that manager did not understand the specific attachment style of their teammates and thus failed to recognize how to work with people's limitations instead of feeding into the pattern um, of dysfunction. In either scenario, the manager is the one who doesn't get a satisfied result because that manager did not understand the specific attachment style of their teammates and thus failed to recognize how to work with people's limitations. And instead, they just keep feeding into the patterns of dysfunction. This is funny because I feel like I've been that in that situation before. So for me, uh, I feel like I'm more anxious attachment. While well, you're right about like attachment style can be triggered the most in the romantic relationship. But I feel like uh, in the workplace, it affects me as well because um, my top priority is my client, right? I need to get the deadline done on time. I need to satisfy their need and everything because, you know, they are my client and we have to, you know, do the work for them. However, um, I can be very anxious in that situation. However, with my teammate, I, if I be anxious like that, they not gonna, you know, they not gonna be calm and they gonna chaos gonna happen, right? So in that scenario, I really try to calm myself down first before I, you know, delegate tasks to the team and try not to my managing and everything because I recognize that some of the teammates tend to be avoidant and one day, once they avoidant, I cannot my role manage them because it's going to be too much for them. Uh, recently, I just read an article that say people doesn't react well with my role management. Actually, our brain doesn't react well with that because um, um, our brain seem to think that my role management is a threat and one human face a threat like that, they tend to shut down and not functioning well so yeah this is very interesting to you know see how attachment style can affect you know in your behavior and your uh, and your productivity at the workplace yeah and i think as a manager it's very important for you to understand how your employee work now you know their work style and your and their behavior and also personality as well. So you cannot, you know, assume that everybody is the same and, you know, uh, push every, um, push your decision on everyone without consider, you know, their personality and their attachment style, for example. Yeah. So with that, um, you know, leaders can have different attachment style too, but I think how they lead the employee and how they, um, transfer the information to the employee really make an impact. So can you provide any of the psychological safety that can be an answer to this problem? Yeah, psychological safety is mentioned so often. We we'll hear a lot about it. It's mentioned in so much literature about leadership, but it is often easier said than done because of the nature of power imbalance, right? The boss always more power 
what is safe for the manager often does not mean it is safe for the others, the employees who are low, who have less power, um, especially to those who don't trust easily, such as your avoidantly attached teammates. They already don't trust, so they really don't trust a person with power telling them, you're in a safe space, right? <laughs> so on the one spectrum, your anxiously attached teammates might suffer from a lack of internal self-confidence and be extra sensitive to negative feedback and criticism from you. I remember they desperately seek approval. And in that in that process, uh, they are often less productive because they spend much more energy worried about the relationship with you, the boss, that it will you know prevent them from focusing on the task at hand. I would say that providing psychological safety in the same manner to all people is not a one-size-fits-all solution. And just like you said, it is important to recognize if you'd ever have that opportunity, um, hopefully not inflicting crisis onto your employees, but you know, observe people in natural settings when things get a little intense, to just take mental note of who needs what kind of support and who might not be um, willing to ask for help proactively, right? Those are your avoidantly attached people trying to hunker down power through by themselves, but deep down they might actually be suffering. So it's a leader's job is kind of learning how to lead people and provide with the intention to provide support so that you can bring the best out of your teammates. Yeah, I think so too, because as a leader, you really need to study your your team behavior and how they, you know, work with certain tasks because everybody is different, right? And then you understand how they you know how their work style and how they deal with trust is might be the best thing to you know work with them and provide support when they need it. So yeah, I think like the leader that we want to have, right? But not every leader understand that and really put an effort into you know understand their employee and their staff. And yeah, it's really important to know that. Um, yeah. So with that, how can a leader overcome a negative impact of their own attachment style when working with their team? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, just said earlier, you know, a lot of leaders probably spend years and years of school learning about the the mechanics of, of managing people, but very few um, courses out there, if, if Amy talks about what is it like to be a human being and as a leader in a leader's role, which really isn't easy. Managing people is one of the hardest jobs. So I think knowing one's own attachment style is crucial in, in knowing how to implement the most effective management style in a crisis. So on the one hand, you learn all the techniques from your textbooks, your business school. But on the other hand, um, if you want to call it emotional intelligence, I'm okay with that, right? Just knowing how to read people and when to use what management style in what situation and to uh, to whom you implement those uh, management style is going to really make a difference in your effectiveness. So much of my work uh, as a therapist involves helping people learn and embrace who they are. Uh, not necessarily who they were told they should be by their parents, by their teachers, or by society. Learning about one's own attachment style is not for the purpose of changing who they are in order to achieve someone else's goals and aspirations for them, right? Learning about one's own attachment style helps one pick the right fit of a team, the right work environment and career that makes it possible for the person to seek safety and explore new things, especially in times of distress. One of the most important things in leadership and management we learn, Crystal, is how to inspire and nurture intrinsic motivation. I go back to emphasizing that attachment style is not a label that will help us put people in familiar boxes in order to manage them more easily. Attachment style is something to be recognized as individuals one one's own culture. There isn't a one solution for all cultures to live cohesively, but there's hope in coexistence with the understanding that people have their own boundaries limitations, and triggers. A leader's job is perhaps better described as a builder of trust, a secure bond with their team over time. Mm, yeah, I think so too. So 
when I was in business school and what business school teach us is very like you have to get the work done like accounting need to be done marketing need to be done uh, you have to go over the expense calculating this calculating that making sure everything is good however they never deep dive into how we treat people how we delegate the tasks and how we understand people and uh, become a real leader not the boss right so yeah i think it's really important for a leader um besides learning just how business functioning how to you know do business um by itself but learning how to deal with people as well because you cannot do business by yourself right you need um a team or you need to deal with client is business is people it's always including people so understanding people and understanding how to treat them right is really important for a leader yeah i do have a little bit of research about attachment style and i kind of know that anxious and avoidant attachment kind of tend to attract each other in the relationship right i think i found myself in that situation also so is it the same in the workplace Funny that you should mention that. It does seem that the couple that seek therapy with me can often be observed to experience a lot of miscommunication, uh, a lot of communication challenges with one partner is more avoidantly attached while the other in turn feels anxious because of their partner's avoidant behaviors. So your observation is also correct. Um, I'm not sure it's um, completely fair to say that they attract each other uh, specifically, that I don't know. It is probably fair to say that depending on the setting, the level of a person's avoidant or anxious behaviors could be different, uh, right? So, um, for example, at the workplace, uh, maybe isn't an attraction per se who you work with. You kind of put in together by hiring department. You don't really get to pick who you work with sometimes. It's more like an archetype, you say, if you may. But pe people can definitely potentially be activated by a co-worker's behavior and feel emotionally escalated. It's like suddenly you have these buttons the other person is kind of pressing without them even knowing they're pressing your buttons, right? But perhaps to the point of, you know, you are so activated, you're unable to work effectively. So in that case, um, there's no surprise that in my therapy room, I encounter people who bring me a lot of challenges they experience at work. So the the field marriage and family therapy actually does not exclusively deal with just what happens at home and in intimate relationships a lot of people bring work dilemmas to me and i help them sort it out and guide them to how not to be as activated as they might do as a yeah child. i think that's understandable because I, I think most of us spend most of our time at work and then we have to build relationship with our co-worker, our boss, and some of us have to deal with clients too. So again, it's people business, right? So we spend most of our time dealing with people and that can trigger us sometimes too because we see the people every day. So I think that is understandable that uh, attachment style can be triggered at work as well. Right. So, so there's an article that I have read that highlight the idea that the leader that, you know, adopt more cutthroat attitude tend to, you know, build a business faster than those who prioritize their team member. And, you know, because they face um challenge of making necessary uh, decision resulting in the slower process. For example, if one of their teammates work slow because of their family problem whatsoever and then the leader have to cover up for that or you know keep the team member because they empathize with the team member so that make the business slower so is it accurate to say that avoidant oriented leaders are more effective than others remembering our classmate zach right remember the retiree of u.s coast guard turned phd student organizational leadership said one day during class that you know you can either get things done fast or you can get things done well and you can get things done cheap but you can only pick two 
So depending which two you pick, right? <laughs> so if you, you know, so remember that. So while it is probably debatable, what exactly is well done, right? People, well done is for one person, maybe perfection. The other person's like, oh, it's good enough. Given that there might be many different ways to do business correctly and do it well. Uh, but I personally believe that treating people with respect and fostering long-term engagement in your employees is a better investment for your company from the one. And here's why. One of the most costly investments a company is forced to make is when turnaround is frequent. And a company must rehire and retrain employees to perform at the level of the previous employees, and hopefully better. That takes time and resources. I would say I agree here with our friend Zach that slow, steady, and treating your team right so that they could, you know, they would want to stay and continue to contribute is the better business plan for long term success. What do you think? Yeah, I think the same too. Uh, there is a quote that I really like that say, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. So, yeah, that's what I really like. And uh, yeah, just a quick background for the listener who you know don't know about us so me and helen actually meet in organizational leadership program phd at the chicago school and uh, we met through a program we studied leadership and that's why uh, helen ma- mentioned zach zach is also one of our classmates right yeah hi zach <laughs> yeah hopefully you're listening to this episode yeah Oh, he better. I'm giving him credit. <laughs> okay. So with that, do you have any advice to the new leaders out there? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting timing because, Crystal, um, I just started a grassroots project that I'm hoping to turn into a co-op made of uh, cellists, all the cello players in the greater area of Los Angeles. So as I'm trying to figure out what's the best business model to implement for my own um, organization. I've been looking into co-op model. So I am in, in essence one of the new leaders <laughs> out there. Um, and advice, I think what I would I would like to follow as what I would give others advice would be uh, to get to know yourself, right? And your tendencies before you assemble your team in the very early stage of formation, picking the right teammates. This means not just choosing the people who are similar to you and with whom you can easily get along with, uh, but actually look at where you are missing your toolbox and find the people with opposite strengths who can complement you and balance your weaknesses and are not afraid to offer a different perspective. You might have more differences than things you have in common, but the good news is that things that activate your triggers may not affect them so that when you are in distress and as a startup, I'm sure we'll be in a lot of distress uh, every step of the way. <laughs> um, I hopefully can count on my teammates being calm and carry on when I am activated. And so that gives me a moment to pause and say, ooh, okay, so I'm not alone here. I can trust my teammate to have my back when I need them so I can process my own triggers and not be so activated into a frantic state. And imagine if my friends are very similar with me who have same temperament, same, possibly same triggers, same attachment styles. We all freak out at the same time. Then it's game over. So <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, leaders out there can um, really reconsider the idea of uh, working with people you have less in common with because chances are you have different strengths. And that is perhaps one of the most valuable things that. Um, you know, startup company could really use. And most importantly, find the people with whom you can feel safe being yourself and not judged. Because only in safety, we can continue to explore and grow ourselves and our education. That's amazing. I want to congratulations for you to, you know, just start your no- new journey, become a new leader. I'm very excited for you to do that. And yeah, I, I think the same too. Like we all grow in the safety environment. Even though we have, because we have to pay stressful situation together, right? Especially like a startup, because we have to face uncertainty, trust, and everything. But having like a partner that can support you 
through that challenge or someone who you can rely on is really important. Yeah, with that, I want to shout out to Kazuki too. He's a co-host of the this podcast and also my co-founder of Markister. You know, during challenging time, you know, we always, we face it together, but usually one of us gonna be more freaked out than the other, but then the other gonna be calm and then calm the situation down. Then we go on together because we face a lot of challenges. However, because we are in this together, we are face challenging together. And then, you know, we grow together. So yeah, really grateful that, you know, have a business partner like that. Sure. So that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much, Helen, to be here joining us today on the discussion of attachment style in leadership. As always, thanks for listening to Supercharged with Digital Marketer. If you enjoy our show, please follow, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to come back in two weeks for another discussion. Until then, this is Crystal. And don't forget, don't stop and keep believing. See you next time. Thank you for having me.